a million years or more, Arizona has been lying in the sun, its vast treasures hidden in an arid soil that seemed to hold but little promise for men whose homes had been in greener lands, its secret wealth locked away too among inaccessible, forbidding mountains which lured men with the hope of gold and silver, then deluded them or fitfully rewarded their persistent efforts. Here dwelt an ancient race people who had little use for precious metals. However, with the aid of primitive irrigation, they unwittingly gathered some of the mineral wealth of the soil in growing crops. Fifth in size in the Union, the area of the state of Arizona comprises almost 114,000 square miles. While it owes much of its prosperity to mining, there are also great ranges for livestock and large areas for irrigated farmland. In the physiographic pattern of Arizona, mountains mark a roughly defined zone stretching diagonally across the state from the southeast to the northwest. The addition of county boundaries to this map will help to locate the principal mining districts designated by dots. They are largely confined to the mountainous belt. In the northeastern section is a high plateau attaining an elevation of 7,000 feet in which lies the vast pit of the Grand Canyon. The southwestern plateau dips nearly to sea level. Agriculture, of course, follows the valleys. Four centuries ago, a legend lured exploring Coronado. It must have been Indian pueblos such as this, for the ancient cliff dwellers had long since vanished that formed the basis of fantastic tales of the seven golden cities of Cibola. There was, in fact, no ready gold for Coronado to plunder but gold in abundance awaited men who would work for it. The earliest discoveries were in the stream beds, and where these placer deposits seemed promising, miners would construct cradles or rockers with which to wash and concentrate the gold-bearing sand and gravel. Agitation in water served to wash away the sand and gather particles of gold at the bottom. The pan was the placer prospector's indispensable tool, capable of smaller production than the cradle but sometimes the means of recovering considerable gold. Some men deliberately settled down to placer mining. Others regarded these deposits only as clues to the fabulously rich mother load which they persistently sought. The patient, ever hopeful prospector was the pioneer in the development of Arizona's mineral resources, certain only of the one rule that gold is where you find it. First among the prospectors in Arizona is said to have been Antonio Espejo, who discovered gold in 1583 near the present city of Prescott, but serious mining did not begin until nearly three centuries later. The town of Tombstone today still has relics of the riotous prosperity which it enjoyed soon after prospector Ed Schieffelin discovered silver there in 1878. The lavish entertainment of the Crystal Bar was not the only consequence of boom times. Truly great artists of the musical world and stage played at the Opera House and Birdcage Theater. Though the town attained notoriety by the exploits of certain desperadoes, a great body of citizens possessed backgrounds of distinction and culture, which they were not ready to abandon. Once the scene of feverish activity, the first great mine of Tombstone stands weed-grown and idle now. The Bonanza silver deposits of early days produced millions of dollars. When these were exhausted, the miners moved on to new fields, except those whose faulty judgment had brought them to permanent rest in the Boot Hill Cemetery. Some mining operations still go forward at Tombstone, though on no such scale as in the rousing days of the 80s. In modern times, copper has become the predominant metal in Arizona's mineral production. Bisbee, which in Tombstone's heyday was only a rocky canyon, is now the thriving center of an important copper mining district. The first productive work on the Copper Queen was begun in 1880. The Sacramento pit is an example of large-scale open pit work done largely in the 1920s. Extensive underground mining is carried on at the Copper Queen, which is a large producer of copper. Operating methods are typical of modern underground mining. The mine is entered through vertical shafts in which miners timbers, drilled steel, and other supplies are lowered on cages, and ore is hoisted to the surface. 
Within the mine are over 400 miles of workings. This scene is on the 2250 foot level. Constant circulation of fresh air is maintained by powerful fans. And despite the arid country above, 7,000 gallons of water must be pumped from the workings every minute. Procedure here is characteristic of efficient hard rock mining. The ore is mined in chambers or stopes, which are driven upward from the drifts. Experience determines the most effective location and loading of the drill holes. The town of Ajo is another center which owes its existence to the discovery of a large body of copper ore. This open pit mine has been operating for about 20 years. Stripping of waste and mining of ore proceed simultaneously. Churn drills are used to bore holes for blasting. Ordinarily, groups of 50 to 80 holes are blasted at one time. Such a large-scale blast requires about 15 tons of dynamite, which is loaded with care and wired for electrical detonation. These methods are well adapted to efficient breaking of large volumes of ore. The upheaval of shattered ore produced by such a blast is a spectacular sight. Morency, oldest copper camp in Arizona, has become in one sense the youngest, with the starting of a large open pit operation on low-grade ore. Mining methods here are similar to those in the open pit at Ajo. Jerome is one of the older copper camps in Arizona. It is recorded that some work was done on the outcrop of the famous United Verde ore body as early as 1876. The upper part of this ore body has been mined as an open pit, which is now nearly completed at a depth of 800 feet, although the pit will continue to furnish waste for filling. Below the open pit, Underground mining is conducted by methods similar to those in the Copper Queen mine. In the open pit, the broken ore is loaded into trucks, which are then dumped into chutes leading to a mine tunnel about 400 feet below. There it is drawn into ore cars and hauled out to bins at the surface to be loaded into railroad cars for transfer to the crushing plant at the smelter. Concentration of the low-grade ore is carried on in a large flotation mill. This is a necessary intermediate step before the smelting of low-grade ore. The ore is first crushed, then pulverized in ball mills, after which the resultant pulp is conveyed to flotation cells. Here, chemicals are added to the pulp so that bubbles, formed by forcing air into the cells, will pick up the copper minerals and bring them to the top in the form of a froth. At a smelter, copper ore and concentrates are received as raw materials and converted into metallic copper. Roasting and smelting are followed by other processes for the removal of various impurities such as iron and sulfur. At Miami is another mine which contributes to the copper production of Arizona. Here the powerhouse and concentrator are visible from the highway. Some of the ore is treated by flotation and some by a leaching process. The tailing or waste material is piled in large dumps, as may be seen here. Still another copper producer is at inspiration. Here the ore is treated by a leaching process. Once more, we observe vast tailing dumps. Large bins hold a reserve of ore so that the leaching plant may be operated continuously. Methods of mining employed here are typical underground caving methods. Copper is also mined at Ray, where there's a body of low-grade sulfide ore. This was the first mine in the Southwest to use a block caving system of mining on a large scale. Shafts have been sunk to a depth of 600 feet. The ore is first crushed, then sent to Hayden for concentration and smelting. Still another producer is the magma mine at Superior, not far from Ray. Here, a highly complex ore is mined, concentrated, and smelted. Although copper is the principal metal, some gold, silver, and zinc are recovered as byproducts. The concentrator at Hayden receives coarse crushed copper ore from the mines. This is crushed again, then ground extremely fine in ball mills, and finally concentrated by flotation. Tailings are discharged by gravity. Recently, some copper ore has been discovered in the northern part of the state in arid Coconino County near the Gap. This is one of the few mines outside the truly mountainous part of Arizona. The deposit is accessible at the surface and lends itself to mining in an open pit. Most of the miners here are Indians. The ore is leached with dilute sulfuric acid in wooden tanks 
and copper sulfate crystals are produced by evaporation of the leach liquor. This property has a daily output of about 50 tons of ore. There are numerous other small copper mines in Arizona. We turn now to the story of gold, starting at picturesquely located Gold Road in the San Francisco district, one of the outstanding gold districts of Arizona. In this area, the ores are silicious, and the cyanide process is generally employed for the recovery of gold. Such is the case here. Within the last three years, Gold Road has become the leading producer in the San Francisco district. One of the largest producers in the San Francisco district has been the Tom Reed mine at Oatman, which to 1939 has yielded more than $15 million worth of gold. There are about 16 miles of underground workings which attain a maximum depth of 1,400 feet. The plant includes a cyanide mill capable of handling 300 tons of ore daily. It is well to remember, however, that small mines, of which the Red Rover near Cave Creek is typical, account in the aggregate for an important share of Arizona's mineral output. There are perhaps a thousand such operations, according to an estimate of the Arizona Small Mine Owners Association. Of course, unit costs in small-scale work are likely to be higher than in large-scale work. Hence, a higher grade of ore is needed to make a small mine profitable. In the Vulture Mountains, northwest of Phoenix, is a gold-producing operation with several sources of ore. In addition to underground mining, old glory holes are being worked. This property was originally opened by Henry Wickenburg, famed pioneer prospector. Now the tailing dump of the old mine is being reworked as another source of gold, and modern cyanide methods recover some gold that was lost in early days. From the mountainside, we look down upon the Alvarado gold mine, not far from Congress. Opened in 1900, it has now reached a depth of 1,500 feet. Here, the daily output averages about 90 tons of silicious ore, carrying both silver and gold. The finely crushed ore is treated with a weak solution of sodium cyanide. This dissolves the metals, which are then precipitated on zinc shavings or dust. In northwestern Arizona, near Chloride, is the producer's mine. Known as the Pilgrim when it was first opened, this operation has proved an important source of gold. Mining operations here have attained a depth of 600 feet. A cyanide plant of 300 tons daily capacity has been built, and the ore treated here yields about equal quantities of gold and silver. The precipitate is reduced to bullion at the mine, and bricks like this, looking far less valuable than they are in fact, are shipped to the United States Mint at San Francisco. At chloride, the gold ore contains lead and zinc as well as silver. The Arizona magma mine, though comparatively young, has already produced 85,000 tons of ore from workings now down more than 500 feet. Plenty of water is available here and the ore is treated by flotation. The Iron King mine in the Big Bug District near Humboldt is working on the 500 foot level. Some of its ore is of smelting grade and the remainder is treated by flotation to yield concentrates containing iron, zinc and lead as well as gold. This is one of many mines which owe their prosperity largely to the discovery of satisfactory methods for treating complex ores. The Golden Turkey Mine at Cordes is the leading gold producer in the Black Canyon District. The ore, containing also lead and silver, occurs in flat bed-like veins at 300 foot depth and is mined in much the same manner as coal by a room and pillar method. The underground workings now have a total length of about 20 miles. Part of the golden turkey ore is sent directly to the smelter and the rest is concentrated by flotation. The Lynx Creek District has the largest placer mine in the state of Arizona. Here in an old creek bed rests a deposit of gold bearing gravel some 20 feet deep, accumulated by long periods of erosion from the hillsides. Operating from the dry bank, the drag line digs the gravel and conveys it to the floating washer. There it is first screened to discharge the coarser boulders and pebbles. Then the finer gravel is washed over riffled tables supplied with a small amount of mercury which, due to its strong affinity for gold, amalgamates the fine gold particles 
and collects them in the spaces behind the riffles. Near Quartzite in Lachala district is a so-called drift placer mine, several examples of which are found throughout Arizona. Gold is washed from a cemented gravel obtained from the 150-foot shaft. This district shows evidence of gold mining by Spaniards four centuries ago. Silver, which accounted for Arizona's early boom at Tombstone, is now recovered chiefly as a byproduct of copper and lead ores. A few localities, however, yield so-called dry siliceous ores containing little of value except silver and gold. Such a mine has been reopened near Duncan. Most of the ore is concentrated by flotation, although some is shipped directly to a smelter. In the Oro Blanco Mountains near Ruby, the most productive deposits of lead and zinc ores in Arizona have been worked for many years. The Eagle Pitcher Mine, which was opened in the 1870s, is the state's largest producer of zinc and lead. These are obtained from a highly complex ore which also carries silver, gold, and copper. The daily output of some 300 tons is concentrated by flotation. Because of the fundamentally different smelting processes involved, lead concentrates are shipped to El Paso for smelting, while zinc concentrates go to another smelter at Amarillo, Texas. Metals used for making special alloy steels are growing in importance. At Tiger, the Mammoth St. Anthony mine yields an ore containing molybdenum and vanadium. An aerial tramway transports this complex ore to the mill. There, by table concentration and selective flotation, the several minerals are separated, yielding byproduct lead, gold, and silver. In the Dragoon Mountains, there are scattered deposits of tungsten ores. Their importance is not yet established, although some estimates indicate large reserves. Developments in this area thus far have not been on any large scale, although a number of mines are in operation. This one has a daily output of about 50 tons of ore, averaging 30 pounds of tungsten mineral to the ton. The mineral here is the tungstate of manganese, known as hubnerite. The largest producer of tungsten in Arizona is the Boreana mine located near Yucca. In this case, the mineral in the ore is wolframite, which when concentrated contains about 70% of tungsten trioxide. Complicated chemical treatments must be carried out to recover the pure metal, which is important in the making of high-speed tool steels, lamp or radio tube filaments, and electrical contact points. Tungsten is also used in chemical industries. An electro-metallurgical laboratory of the United States Bureau of Mines is appropriately located near Boulder Dam, where abundant electrical energy is available. Here, among other experiments, work of possible significance is being done on manganese. This is a very important auxiliary metal consumed in the steel industry, where it is commonly employed in the form of ferromanganese. The better grades of this alloy are made in electric furnaces. Certain other industries prefer pure manganese metal, expensive to produce by present standard methods. A promising recent development is the production of pure manganese by electrolysis of solutions obtained by leaching suitably prepared manganese ores, which may be lower in grade than those required for smelting in electric furnaces. Results at this laboratory may help the development of manganese ore deposits known to occur in the Artillery Peak District of Arizona. South of Payson, a deposit of cinnabar is mined, and the mercury is distilled in oil-fired kills. Development of mercury deposits is much stimulated by wartime demands. Although metals constitute the chief mineral wealth of Arizona, which is not true of the United States as a whole, the state has a fair share of useful non-metallic minerals. This quarry near Douglas produces limestone. Some of it is used as building stone, but most of the output is consumed for metallurgical purposes in the vicinity. Another useful non-metallic mineral is gypsum, mined near Douglas and treated in this plant. Uncalcined, it is used to retard the setting of Portland cement. The calcined form, plaster of Paris, is sometimes cast into tiling. This plant supplies a considerable part of the building plaster used in Arizona. Another non-metallic product is sericite, obtained at Buckeye. 
This silky form of mica is pulverized for use in certain kinds of motor lubricants and as a surface for some types of prepared roofing. It is also employed as a filler in paint and as a coating for paper. Near Kingman in northwestern Arizona is a commercial deposit of feldspar. This mineral is essential for the manufacture of enamel ware and pottery, being indispensable for the production of ceramic glazes. Feldspar is also added to the mix when making those varieties of glass in which toughness and wear resisting qualities are desired. Most of the output of this particular quarry is crushed and shipped to Pacific Coast potteries. Near Chambers in Apache County, a clay deposit has been developed and is producing a variety of fuller's earth, largely employed for the clarification of lubricating and edible oils. Reached by a tunnel into the mountainside, the mineral is brought out in cars and dumped into a chute from which trucks are loaded. This clay has proved particularly suitable for the treatment of edible oils. About 90% of the output is exported. Another uncommon mineral resource has been developed at the onyx quarry near Cave Creek. This variegated form of silica lends itself more to decorative than to utilitarian purposes. When polished, the rock reveals attractive patterns. It is used in novelties, lamps, clocks, and various objects of art. In Gila County are Arizona's only developed resources of chrysotile asbestos. This is the most valuable variety of asbestos because it combines fire resistance with adaptability to spinning and weaving. Although the United States leads the world in asbestos manufacture, it has to import nearly all of the raw material chiefly from Quebec and South Africa. Some of the Arizona product is of excellent grade. The most highly valued asbestos has long, pliable fibers like those shown here, suitable for spinning into yarn and weaving fabrics. At Sholo, the Apache mine is producing a small tonnage of high volatile bituminous coal. The mine is operated in a national forest area under government permit, and the output is sold locally at Globe in Miami. Explosives for much of the mining work done in Arizona are furnished by the large and modern plant of the Apache Powder Company near Benson. Now that we have reviewed representative examples of Arizona's varied mining activities, we may follow some of her splendid modern highways on a swift tour of exploration, which will serve to acquaint us with her other resources, all significant in the economic picture of the state. High in the mountains near Prescott, we discover the scenic beauty of granite dells, a striking contrast to the scenes of industry which have made the state notable for mineral production. Such highways make accessible not only magnificent scenery, but whole new aspects of Arizona. One of the first of the large federal reclamation projects was Roosevelt Dam, designed to provide both irrigation water and electric power. Blocking the narrow canyon of the Salt River, it creates a reservoir almost 23 miles long. An even greater storage capacity is provided behind Coolidge Dam, largest multiple dome dam in the world. It holds back Gila River waters to irrigate lands in the Casa Grande Valley. And now we come to the northwestern corner of the state where the Colorado River turns its course from west to south. Boulder Dam, one of the largest of federal reclamation projects, is the highest dam in the world and one of the great engineering feats of all time. Into it went not only steel and concrete, but, in less direct ways, innumerable other contributions from the mineral world. These great projects may be viewed as means of reclaiming a special kind of mineral wealth, the plant foods which lie useless in arid soil. The electric power generated here is transmitted as far as to the cities of Southern California. Great irrigation works involve not only mighty dams, but extensive structures to control the waters, such as may be seen near Yuma. Under control here is enough water to irrigate about 800,000 acres of arid but fertile land. Part of the area served by this project is in Arizona, and part lies in the Imperial Valley of California across the Colorado River. Diversion gates are opened according to schedule, and the water is thus directed into various fields at appropriate times. 
For the use of this water, landowners pay fees which are based upon the number of acres they have under irrigation. And as the irrigation waters flood the thirsty land, we see the beginning of that marvelous transformation which, truly, makes the desert blossom as the rose. Amazing crops are stimulated as water releases imprisoned mineral plant foods. Irrigated agriculture in great variety may be seen in widely separated parts of Arizona. This field of carrots near Alfreda supplies the mining communities of the state and furnishes car loads for shipment to eastern markets. Another successful crop is asparagus, intensively cultivated on this farm not far from Tucson. With abundant water and warm sunshine, the stalks grow six to eight inches in 24 hours. Asparagus produces two crops a year in Arizona, the winter harvest being particularly in demand in eastern markets. Cut off below the ground, the stalks are sorted by size, bundled, trimmed, and crated. In this field, a promising crop of sugar beets is on the way to maturity. The abundance of Arizona sunshine is an important factor in accounting for their high yield of excellent sugar. The American appetite for leafy vegetables has given great impetus to the Arizona lettuce crop, particularly during the winter. Unlike most other farm products, lettuce can neither be frozen nor preserved in other ways. The crisp heads must therefore be harvested in their prime and sent by fast transport to market. Even such scenes as this can give only a fragmentary idea of the scope of Arizona agriculture. On some farms, new methods are being devised and tested. Thus, experience at Arizona's famed Cortaro Farms in applying insecticides to cotton by dusting the fields from an airplane suggested the possibility of seeding grassland in the same way. Tests disclosed that a plane flying at an elevation of only 50 feet can distribute seed evenly over a 35-foot swath and can cover 100 acres per hour. This may prove of value to Arizona cattlemen for improving the stand of native grasses on the rangelands. Average figures for a quarter century establish Arizona as producer of the largest crop of extra long staple cotton grown in the United States. This premium cotton is produced chiefly in Pima County, where the soil is favorable and the climate ideally suited, except that inadequate rainfall must be compensated by irrigation waters. Tree crops, too, respond handsomely to irrigation. Pecan trees, which flourish here, can be grown in only a few parts of the United States. Shaken from the trees, the nuts are gathered and made ready for shipment. A ground cloth helps to collect them. Pecans are encased in a protective husk, which must be removed before the nut in its true shell, as we know it, is disclosed. Date palms represent another introduction from far lands. Experimental plantings have succeeded well in the year-round sunshine and frost-free climate of southern Arizona, as the panorama of this magnificent date garden near Yuma reveals. Some success has also attended the experimental growing of figs. In the past, dates were generally dried for commercial packing, but a good part of the crop being harvested here will be shipped to market as fresh fruit. In the citrus field, Arizona is making inroads upon the older established regions. Irrigated orange groves have already made that crop a factor in the prosperity of Arizona farmers. In this particular grove, fine grapefruit are being harvested. Crops like these must be credited in part to climate, but in large degree also to the mineral wealth of a rich soil, valueless without water, but priceless when the boon of irrigation is added. Cattle raising is a long-established industry in Arizona and one which retains marked importance to the state. The small semi-wild cattle of earlier years have vanished, and today fine herds of white-faced Herefords dot the ranges, while cowboys still play their part as in the romantic past. Finally, before we turn to Arizona resources of a totally different kind, we may round out our survey with a view of what is said to be the largest yellow pine forest in the world. This is part of the state's estimated reserve of 18 billion feet of such timber, mostly in national forests where cutting is under government supervision. Among the valuable resources of Arizona are those like the wonderland of rocks in the Shirikawa National Monument, which people come to admire and to enjoy, but never take away except in their memories one may capture something of the days of Spanish colonization in various ancient structures 
none more beautiful than the Mission San Xavier del Buc, founded in 1700 by the sturdy Jesuit Father Kino. For many visitors, the desert holds deep fascination with its giant cacti, seen here in Saguaro National Monument. The beautiful cactus blossom is the state flower. One need not be an archaeologist to be genuinely interested in Montezuma Castle National Monument, which is not a castle at all, but a communal dwelling built by Stone Age people in a cavity in the face of a vertical cliff. The inhabitants of this place worked a prehistoric salt mine, and one of them, killed by a rockfall there, is considered the first mine accident victim in North America. Adjoining the Mexican line in southwestern Arizona is the Organ Pipe Cactus National Monument. This plant grows as much as 20 feet tall, bears edible fruits, and is one of the rarer members of the cactus family. Modern travelers may approach Phoenix from the east by the scenic highway called the Apache Trail. It follows the old route of Apache Indian raiders when they descended on the Pima and Maricopa tribes. Canyon Lake on the Apache Trail is a resort area with bathing, fishing, and motorboat racing as its most popular attractions. To the northward and in the area east of the Grand Canyon is the Painted Desert. Here, 50,000 Navajos live on the largest Indian reservation in the country. Sparse vegetation confines them to scattered settlements, for they are a pastoral people and must find sustenance in this dry land for their flocks of goats, whose hair they weave into excellent rugs. In sharp contrast is the luxuriant beauty of Oak Creek Canyon, only a hundred miles south of the colorful but barren land of the Painted Desert. Here, near Flagstaff, are massive red buttes in brilliant coloring. Beautiful in the eyes of all visitors, Oak Creek Canyon, in addition, holds a special interest for fishermen. Scenery such as this possesses a value to the state, which is no less substantial because it is not a commodity. Its appeal is not limited to Arizona city dwellers seeking a pleasant place of resort, but may exert an even greater influence upon travelers from afar who thus first come to know the state. The magnificent snow-capped San Francisco peaks tower 12,600 feet above sea level. The highest mountains in Arizona, they served pioneers as a landmark from great distances. One interesting version of an ancient Indian legend makes these mysterious shimmering peaks the home of the mythological Thunderbird. Another eye-compelling sight, which may be viewed from the main highway northeast of Flagstaff, is Sunset Crater. This is the truncated cone of an ancient volcano gray at its base, with its upper edge bearing very colored deposits of sulfur, which in appropriate light give the rim the appearance of sunset glow. Within the period of ancient Indian habitation of this region, an eruption produced wide lava beds, which on cooling assumed the rugged form seen here. The same eruption deposited great fields of volcanic cinders, which contributed generously to the fertility of the land. Attention was first drawn to the petrified forest in northeastern Arizona in 1850, but the area was not made a national monument until 1906. The record of the rocks discloses that a great forest of Triassic time, possibly many million years ago, was slowly buried in mud and sand. Obscure chemical processes replaced wood cells with a new structure of silica and colored this with oxides of iron and manganese. The precise chemistry of the alteration is not yet known. The geological story of the Grand Canyon is an open book. Surely no other place has a better claim to the title of the world's greatest natural wonder. Standing at the rim, the spectator views the thread-like Colorado River, which flows for 200 miles through the gorge, at this point about a mile deep and 14 miles from rim to rim. Of the thousands of travelers who come to marvel at it, Many content themselves with well-organized motor excursions along the 75-mile highway which follows the South Rim. Many others, however, are ambitious to descend into the canyon itself. This usually means following the famous Bright Angel Trail designed by government engineers to whom both beauty and safety were important considerations. Thousands of visitors have made the trip to Phantom Ranch and the river's edge mounted on sure-footed mules, of which it is said that they've never lost a tourist. Some members of the Hopi tribe have their adobe house with its modern sun decks near the hotels on the south rim of the canyon. Here, native craftsmen may be seen fashioning silver ornaments, making baskets, weaving rugs and blankets, or shaping their fragile pottery. 
Each afternoon there is a demonstration of the colorful ceremonial dances dedicated to Indian deities. At Desert View stands an observation tower, a faithful reproduction of strange towers erected by ancient inhabitants of the southwest centuries ago. The view from the tower discloses a forbidding and inaccessible landscape, but these very qualities commended it to ancient Indians. Nearly 500 ruined pueblos have been found in the canyon, and the agricultural Havasupai still dwell there. Indian ruins turn back the clock for centuries, yet they seem scarcely older than this view of Tucson as it looked only 80 years ago. As in prehistoric times, adobe and logs were the principal building materials, both exceedingly long-lived in this arid climate. This Tucson of 1859, however, is of modern construction, a motion picture set. And here is the astonishing contrast which hardly more than a lifetime has wrought. The Tucson of today, possessed of its own special charm and distinction among the beautiful cities of Arizona. It offers cultural life and opportunities equal to those of many larger cities in the eastern states, and its unsurpassed winter climate attracts visitors from around the world, many of whom have seasonal homes here. The University of Arizona, founded by the Territorial Legislature in 1885, is prominent in the affairs of Tucson. With 2,800 students and an annual budget approaching $2 million, the university serves the state well. Here, young men are trained in mining and metallurgy, as well as in other engineering subjects and learn to combine theoretical knowledge with practical experience. Another kind of education which Arizona supplies with splendid effect is the initiation of Easterners to the stimulating outdoor life of the West. A growing number of dude ranches provide for the accommodation of guests, sometimes in conjunction with working cattle ranches. Good companions, fine horses, and the active life in the open combine to make this a highly popular winter vacation. Not all cowboys nowadays are concerned with cows, for many have become dude wranglers, with the entertainment of guests as their principal duty. It may look like play, but dude ranching is in fact an important Arizona business. The modern city of Phoenix stands near the site of what was a busy community when Spanish explorers first visited the region in 1539. Its metropolitan area now comprises a population of 120,000, yet Phoenix conveys the impression of being, in fact, a much larger city. Located in the fertile Salt River Valley, it enjoys a warm, dry, and sunny climate. This accounts for its exceptional standing as a winter resort and has justified the building of hotels which rank with the world's finest. Not content merely with being proud of its climate, Arizona has enthusiastically made the most of it. This, with characteristic Arizona hospitality, has gone far to publicize the state. Phoenix boasts also a handsome state capital, built of native tufa and set in a beautiful park, landscaped with specimens of native trees, plants, and shrubs. This, then, is Arizona, in size, fifth state of the Union. One half of its people are supported by its mining industry, while others develop the latent opulence of its desert soils. The cactus state today stands merely at the threshold of a future to which unmeasured opportunity beckons. <laughs>